Uh, hello, everyone. Good, uh, good evening, good, uh, good afternoon, or good morning uh, to, to you, depending on where you are. Thank you for joining us today, the 11th Global Webinar of Visionic Dandelion College, broadcast from China to the globe. Visionic Dandelion College is a free online platform for the purpose of uh, starting and learning the cutting edge know-how and insights of the point of care ultrasound applications with global professionals and medical practitioners. My name is Alex Yan from Wisonic Medical in Shenzhen, China. So today we are very honored to have Dr. Colin Rigney as the webinar speaker and Dr. Tyler Slim as the webinar moderator to give us a speech on hand and wrist ultrasound diagnosis and case studies. So right now, please let me give a brief introduction to our webinar moderator, Dr. Tyler Slim. So Dr. Tyler Slim, Dr. Tyler Slim is a current third year uh, doctor of uh, physical therapy. Uh, let me show that. A physical therapy student at AT Steel University in Mesa, Arizona. He's uh, from California and have a passion and acumen for outpatient orthopedic, as well as working with athletes. In his free time, he loves work out at the gym and stay healthy as well as do martial arts. He's a black belt in Taekwondo and currently practice another form of martial arts called Club Maga. In his uh, free time, he also hang out with friends and family. He was fortunate enough to have Colin Rigney as his radiology and imaging professor at AT Steel University in the Doctor of Physical Therapy program. Uh, so let's uh, welcome uh, Tyler Slim to give a uh, present uh, uh, introduction to Dr. Colin Rigney, please. Thank you, Alex. Um, let me share my screen. All right. So as Alex said, I'm a third year physical therapy student. My name is Tyler Slim, and I'm gonna introduce our speaker, Colin Rigney. He's a seasoned MSK ultrasound diagnostician and orthopedic physical therapist operating as a physician extender in the greater Phoenix metro area in Arizona. He serves as adjunct faculty at AT Still University with a demonstrated history of working in the higher education industry since 2013. Colin teaches radiology and imaging at the resident physical therapy program at AT Still University in Mesa, Arizona. Colin works as a consultant in MSK ultrasound diagnostics and needle guided procedures for physicians across multiple specialties and as a minority partner in outpatient surgery center as well as managing partner for modern physical therapy in the Phoenix area. Colin graduated physical therapy school from AT Still University in Mesa, Arizona, and served his orthopedic residency at AT Still University as well. He has extensive postgraduate training, including additional board certifications in orthopedics, physical therapy, and registered in musculoskeletal ultrasound. So I'll hand it over to our main speaker, Dr. Colin Rigney. I'll stop sharing. All right. All right. Well, thank you guys. Uh, so thank you, Alex and Wysonic. Thanks, Tyler. Uh, this is a talk on the hand, wrist and ultrasound and specifically on the diagnostics. So we're gonna run through, I'm gonna do my best to run through um, how, we, how we regionalize the, the scanning process for all the anatomy structures in the hand and the wrist. So we're gonna, 
we're, we're going to organize the, the exam into volar and dorsal. And we're going to um, go for the structures um, of these 11 points. So we're going to go with the carpal tunnel, Guillain's canal, flexor tendons, the six dorsal tendon extensor compartments, the distal radial ulnar joints, the dorsal joint recesses, and the scapulonate ligament, the lunotriquitral ligament, and the triangular fibrocartilage complex, as well as the flexor tendons and the metacarpal phalangeal joint, the, the, uh, and the interphalangeal joint, and the joint capsule, and the annular pulleys, and the ulnar collateral ligament of the thumb. Hey, sweetie, sweetie, you need to go out, please. So we're going to start with the volar exam in the hand and the wrist. We have the median nerve, the carpal tunnel itself, Guillain's canal, the flexor tendons, and the flexor pollicis longus. So starting with the median nerve. So we like to start in this, uh, in this uh, um, on the forearm. Me, Professor Brittany. Uh, so uh, sorry for the interruption. So just uh, could you like uh, share your screen, share your slide? Oh, I'm so sorry. We can we can see all of that. No worries. I'm sorry, Alex. Okay, there you go. Thank okay. you. Okay, I, I apologize, you guys. Okay, no worries. Okay, please go on. <laughs> okay, so we're gonna pay attention to the median nerve first. That's where we're gonna direct. That's where the majority of the problems in the volar hand and wrist are going to be. This is gonna be with the median nerve. So in order to visualize the problem, we have to have a systematic way of evaluating the area. And so starting in this part of this portion of the forearm, kind of at the mid portion of the forearm, looking at the ultrasound probe on the, on the hand, okay, we're gonna move it down distally. And so I'm gonna direct your attention to the right side where you have the nerve in the middle of the screen, this hyperechoic structure, it looks like a honeycomb in, in cross section or short axis. And underneath here, this is the flexor digitorum profundus muscle. And above is the flexor digitorum superficialis. And this is gonna be a dynamic picture of moving distally and watching the nerve come up into the carpal tunnel. And so that's how, we were gonna, that's how we're gonna start the exam. And then once we're in the carpal tunnel, as you can see, usually about the level of the wrist crease where you can see the probe is on the wrist in short axis. We like to get this picture where we see the, the arrows are, are pointing to the flexor retinaculum or the transverse carpal ligaments. Um, this denotes kind of the, the space in the anatomy where the carpal tunnel is. And the, the structure in the, on the top, usually it's in the center and towards the top, and maybe directed a little bit radially is the median nerve. And then labeled here, we have the flexor pollicis longus and the flexor uh, digitorum superficialis and profundus deep to it. And then outside, we have our bony landmarks of the pisiform. And then we have Guillain's canal over here and then scaphoid with a flexor carpi radialis is, and these, these structures sit outside of the carpal tunnel. So if you're in the carpal tunnel and you don't under, and you, and you maybe you're, you're trying to figure out where the nerve is, sometimes it's hard to tell if you're looking at the nerve or it's one of the flexor tendons, have the patient wiggle their fingers. And then what you can do is you can watch these tendons move but the nerve does not. So the tendons will move and it'll kind of bump the nerve around, which you'll see right here. So that's just one little tip to um, make, make that portion of the exam a little easier. Um, Guillain's canal, we'll, we'll mark this out. It's usually not a place where you're gonna find a lot of pathology, but it's, I, I, I include it on the exam because it's a checklist of, of anatomic regions where you need to know especially if you're doing needle guided procedures, you wanna know if you're close to this, this uh, artery nerve and vein um, where the ulnar nerve sits in the, in the um, 
next to the pisiform here in Guillain's Canal. And so we're outside of the carpal tunnel here. So the carpal tunnel essentially forms the base. We have the triquitrum down here forming the base and the pisiform is the ulnar border to Guillain's Canal. And if you, um, if you want a scan tip of, of how to best find it, you can always palpate the pisiform on your wrist. It's that prominent little bone and just set the probe right next to it. And usually you're gonna see the artery and the vein and the nerve right at that level. Okay, then we'll go into the uh, flexor tendon, the median nerve and long axis. Okay, so this is a long axis picture of the, uh, of the flexor digitorum profundus and superficialis. And then always superficial to it, you'll see the median nerve. In long axis, the median nerve will look a little more hypoechoic. It'll look a little bit darker in relation to the flexor tendons. And then the flexor retinaculum or the transverse carpal ligament, you can see it. This is pretty prominent uh, hyperechoic structure um, right on the top. And again, if you're unsure of what you're looking at and you're unsure if you're looking at the uh, flexor digitorums uh, tendons versus the nerve, you can always have the patient either actively or passively wiggle their fingers. And you'll see the tendons contract, the nerve does not. So that tells us the tendons are down here and we see the nerve on the top. Okay, and we'll direct our attention to the dorsal part of the exam. Um, we're looking at this, we we'll have the six dorsal tender, uh, six dorsal extensor tendon compartments, the distal radial ulnar joints, the dorsal joint recesses of the radiocarpal um, joints, and the scaphalunate ligament, and the lunotriquitral ligament. And then lastly, the triangular fibrocartilage complex will be part of the dorsal exam. So the first part of the exam is uh, the first dorsal compartment. And keep in mind that the way I the way I structure these protocols is is just my personal style. You can you can use your own sequences, um, whatever you feel comfortable with. I, I just encourage you, how, however you're doing your exams, try to do it the same way every time, so you're always consistent. And so we like to place the place uh, place the patient underneath of like a bolster or a little rolled towel, so we get the we have the arm, the wrist, and slight ulnar deviation. That puts the tendon on a stretch. That lets us see with the ultrasound probe um, more uh, clearly the tendon itself. So we direct our attention to the, to the ultrasound image. We're looking at a cross-sectional picture of the radius, the distal radius at the, at the styloid, and then the compartment of the first dorsal compartment where we have abductor pollicis longus and extensor pollicis brevis. Now, this is the, 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 if you see, look really closely, there's one tendon and two tendons of the abductor pollicis longus and extensor pollicis brevis. They share the same sheath. Now there are anatomic variants um, where they'll, they'll be like dual compartment and sometimes there's, there's tri-compartment um, and, and we'll discuss those briefly later on in the, in, in the, in the presentation here. But for the sake of, for the sake of protocol, um, most of your patients, about 80%, are going to have this, this uniform look on the first dorsal compartment. And then a long axis image of the abductor pollicis longus and extensor pollicis brevis. We're looking um, at this tendon moving left to right on the screen. It's hyperechoic. It has a nice fibrillar pattern. And in the ultrasound position, we see it's the same position that we were looking at the short axis in with the um, with a gel bottle underneath the wrist. So we have a slight ulnar deviation. So we place those structures on a bit of a stretch that lets us see the tendon um, most clearly. Okay, and then I'm gonna put in Lister's tubercle because Lister's tubercle is what separates the third compartment from the second compartment of the, of the, of the tendons. So an easy, way to, an easy way to navigate, especially if you're just learning or or if you're kind of an intermediate learner with ultrasound, especially in the hand and the wrist, you can always palpate the Lister's tubercle as you see me doing here. And then from here, you know that if you go slightly radial, you're gonna have the second dorsal compartment of the extensor carpi radialis brevis and longus. And then owner to that, you're looking at the extensor pollicis longus. Okay, but Lister's tubercle is a nice home-based landmark that you can always go back to if you think you get lost. Okay, so the second dorsal compartment, 
where we have extensor carpi radialis brevis and extensor carpi radialis longus. And you can see this is a healthy tendon because the sheath is barely outlined um, around the tendons. And going ulnarly to Lister's tubercle, we have extensor pollicis longus. And you see this hypoechoic, this little dark structure coming around it. This is the, um, the, the, the sheath of the tendon. So the tendon sheath that, that, that keeps that tendon in, its, in, this little, in this little pathway there of the extensor pollicis longus. In the fourth compartment, where we're going to focus on the extensor indices and extensor digitorum. And next to it, we have the extensor digiti minimi, which sits closest to the ulna. So we have the radius and then the ulna. And this is the radial ulnar joint. You always find the extensor digiti minimi closest to the ulna. So again, the, the nice part about ultrasound is, is not, this is not just a static imaging tool. So the, the, the nice part about it is, is we, we has a, it has a high, it, it, it's most sensitive when you're using it dynamically. And so if you're unsure of what you're, if you're seeing separate tendon compartments, or if you're unsure of what you're looking at as a tendon at all, you can always have the patient wiggle their fingers and you'll see Oh, now I see these tendon compartments, nice outline, this extensor indices, the extensor digitorum, and the extensor digiti minimi, they pop out really nicely there. So that's always a tool you have at your disposal when you're using ultrasound in the hand and the wrist or anywhere for that, and frankly, anywhere in the body. Um, it, that, that's, the, that's, the, that's the best part of ultrasound is the dynamic capacity. And then moving to the ulna, um, we're looking at, as you see the probe is placed here over the ulnar styloid in, in short axis, we're looking at the extensor carpi ulnaris. And usually we like to pick it up just, just a little bit proximal to the ulnar styloid or right about that level and, and, and travel and watch the tendon travel over and it goes over the uh, triangular cartilage complex. And moving over to the radius and the ulna, um, the distal radial ulnar joint. So for those of you out there, if you're a physician who does um, injections or a lot of ultrasound guided intervention. This is a good access point to, to do injections, whether it's um, a form of orthobiologic or steroid into the TFCC, the triangular fibrocartilage complex, or, or, the, or the proximal row of the carpals in the case of osteoarthritis. Um, this is a great access point to place that medication. And the dorsal joint recesses of the radius and the proximal row of the carpals and the distal row of the carpals. So I like this view. I like to start with this view, the radius. So we're looking at the probe. We have the, we have the patient's hand placed over a gel bottle to give it a slight flexion. That brings, that brings the ultrasound picture right into your view. Um, you see the probe is in long axis and we're looking at the distal radius, the lunate, and the capitate. I like to call these th like the three snow cap mountains. And what you should see here, this is a normal appearance. What we're, what we're looking at in the case of normal is nice, smooth, convex landmarks of the bone. I'm just tracing it out. So this is, this was constitutes normal. We have these hyperechoic, these triangular synovial infoldings right here. This is a normal um, dorsal wrist intersection. And it's important to evaluate this area because the, this is the area where in the cases of your rheumatoid arthritis and gout and osteoarthritis, where you're going to see the joint breakdowns, the, your, your bony irregularities, your, your bony erosions, your synovial hypertrophies and fluid collections. Um, these, the fluid collections and, and synovial hypertrophies like to occur in the areas of joint recesses. And so it's always good to just do a cursory scan here, just to scan the health of the region. Okay, and the scaphalunate ligament, um, a, the, a good scan tip you see on the anatomy drawing here, and then the, the, on, the, on, the, on the ultrasound side, a good scan tip here to, to find it reliably, the scaphalunate ligament is to palpate the Lister's tubercle. And so when you palpate Lister's tubercle, 
you're going to move the probe just slightly inferior. So if you're if you're if you're sitting at your computer now, you can palpate Lister's tubercle and and you move distally. If you fall into that, you, the first gap you fall into off of Lister's tubercle will be where you're going to find the scaphalunate ligament, and you can place the probe in in over longitudinally over that ligament space. And we're going to show you what that looks like here. So what we have here, this is the scaphoid and this is the lunate. And this is going to be a video in this triangular structure, this hyperechoic triangular structure is the ligament. And so this is a, this is a stress test of the ligament to assess the integrity of it. And so we're having the patient just slowly make a fist and watch the, ten, or watch the ligament stress itself. And you see it nice and clearly here when they stress it, it's healthy. It comes in very nicely. And so that's a healthy ligament. That's a, that's a good dynamic way to use ultrasound to your advantage to stress and, and investigate the scaphalunate ligament. And if you're going to investigate the scaphalunate ligament, um, especially in the case of if there's been a history of a falling on an outstretched hand or if there is suspicion for instabilities of the carpals um, in, 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 in the joints themselves, you might as well look at the lunotriquitral ligament, which is it's the ligament that connects the lunate and the triquitrum. Um, and it also is a dynamic stabilizer of the hand and the wrist, especially in wrist, extens wrist extension. So if you're going to look at the scaphalunate ligament for injuries, um, I think it's really nice to go look at the, uh, the lunotriquitral ligament as well. And you're looking here, obviously, the lunate, and we have the triquitrum. And then this, this band of tissue connects the two bones. That is the lunotriquitral ligament. And we stress that one the same way as the scaphalunate ligament. Okay, and then we're gonna move, point nine, we're gonna to move to the ulnar side of the wrist, the triangular fibrocartilage complex in, in the extensor carpi ulnaris. So um, you're gonna use the same picture to find the, uh, the, the TFCC, the triangular fibrocartilage complex as you would the extensor carpi ulnaris. So we have the pictures here where we're looking at the distal ulna, where it falls off. This triangular structure is the triangular fibrocartilage complex. Below, we have the radius. We like to move the patient's hand into a radial deviation to place these structures on a bit of a stretch. That brings the radius into our view. And so this triangular infolding is the triangular fibrocartilage complex. And, and over here is the meniscus homologue, which basically is just it's a synovial tissue that, that kind of borders the, the, the cartilage complex itself. And over the top, we have the extensor carpi ulnaris. And the, the, the tendon of the extensor carpi ulnaris is the viewing, the acoustic viewing window where the sound waves penetrate to give us the nice view of the triangular fiber cartilage complex. So if you're on the picture below, you'll see the, the, the color outlines of, of the region where we're looking at the, the, the cartilage itself, we have the meniscus homologue here and then the lunate and the triquitrum and the extensor carpi ulnaris over the top. These are the, these are the landmarks we look for when assessing that. And point 10, we're gonna, we're gonna get into some of the fingers and I'm, I'm, gonna, I'm gonna keep it just to this region because um, there's m so many more things we can do with ultrasound in, in the fingers and the hand and the wrist specifically, but I want to keep it, I want to keep it practical and I want to, I want to stay focused on what, what are the most common clinical things we're going to see. And so by far and away, um, stenosing tenosynovitis of the A1 pulley is probably the most common thing in the fingers that, that we'll see in the clinic. So I'm going to, I'm going to focus my talk around that. And so the position here you see with the patient. Um, we, we keep that finger in it in, in extension and straight. You can also build up a lot of gel over the area to make good contact with the skin. Um, so looking at the metacarpal phalangeal joint, um, this is the metacarpal. And then over here is the proximal phalanx. And this green structure is the volar plates or the ligament capsule that essentially is an extension of, of the flexor tendons where we're looking at um, that integrity as well as the flexor digitorum profundus and the flexor digitorum superficialis. And right above it, we have the A1 pulley 
over the, the top. And this annular pulley system is what, is what keeps the flexor tendons from subluxing and dislocating. And on the right, what you'll see here is a naked picture of just the, the uh, ultrasound image itself. We see this extensor, we see this annular uh, ligament, this slip where we're looking at here, usually you're gonna find it right at the level of the metacarpal phalangeal joint. And point 11, the ulnar collateral ligament of the thumb, um, also known as gamekeeper's thumb. So we, uh, the ultrasound is a very reliable tool at analyzing this ligament. And so, so again, we're, we're looking at an ultrasound picture with the color on the left, we have the first metacarpal intersection with the proximal phalanx. This red is the ligament itself. And the yellow is the aponeurosis of the adductor pollicis. And so why, why, this, why this aponeurosis is important is because in Stenner's lesions, um, if oftentimes in the case of gamekeeper's thumb with a Stenner's lesion, the, the, the aponeurosis attachment to the phalanx will avulse part of the bone and tear the bone away with the ligament at the same time. So it'll, in a, in a sense, tear both of these structures as opposed to just a isolated um, ulnar collateral ligament tear or sprain. And so on the right, we have the ultrasound picture of it. Uh, first metacarpal proximal phalanx, we have the ligament itself connecting the two bones and this adductor pollicis over the top, we can actually see it's kind of fibular right here, inserting over to the proximal phalanx, um, attaching, to, attaching to his bony interface right there. Okay, so we'll get into some case studies. Um, a medial, a median nerve swelling. So what, what median nerve swelling looks like, um, you're looking at the top picture on the left, the, the, the measurement here. This is, this is a very swollen median nerve. If you look at the, look at the measurement as 0.25 centimeters or 25 millimeters. Um, th there's a couple studies I like to reference there where we're looking at the carpal tunnel inlet of, at the level of the pisiform. So this is the pisiform bone here. So right at that level, we like to take a cross-sectional measurement and give us some sensitivity and specificity here and ruling in and ruling out carpal tunnel. So um, you can rule out carpal tunnel with the uh, fewer than eight millimeters squared um, cross-sectional area, and it helps you to rule it in um, with greater than 12 millimeters squared. And now obviously there's a lot of room for wiggle. Um, you're going to, you're going to take into account the patient's history, exam, rule out cervical nerve root involvement. Uh, a lot of things go into the diagnostic process of carpal tunnel, but from a strictly ultrasound perspective, um, this is a, this is a, I, I recommend using this as the tool to, um, objectify the measurements. So swelling of the nerve. So we see this characteristics of it. We see the enlargement of the median nerve, how it's dark. Okay. It's hypoechoic and we see it bulging the transverse ligament at the same time. You see the ligament is kind of bulging over the top of it. Um, and as well as you'll see some flattening of the nerve of the distal tunnel and decreased mobility. The picture on the bottom is a dynamic image. So we're looking at, we're looking at, this is not the same, not the same patient, but um, you're looking at the same level just in a long axis now. So I want you to keep your eyes focused on this portion of the nerve. So on its, on, on a still picture, this doesn't look like um, a, it doesn't look like a bad nerve. It's not overly thickened or it's not overly bulging anywhere, but we're going to have the patient just flex and wiggle their fingers. And what you're going to see down here is you're going to see the entrapment as they wiggle. If you can see how it really closes down right at that level and it thickens up dynamically, that is the beauty of ultrasound right there in a nutshell. So we can look at these things as they're occurring live specifically um, the mobility of the nerve underneath the carpal tunnel. Okay, and trigger finger A1 stenosing tenosynovitis. So A1 is just referring to the first annular pulley. We know there's five annular pulleys, okay, but the most commonly involved one is A1, okay? So we're gonna, we're gonna focus on that. There's a couple things going on. This is the same patient in two different views. There's a couple things going on in these images. We have 
we have a ganglion cyst. So we're looking in long axis on the picture on the right. There's a ganglion cyst just over the level of the proximal phalanx. And over the top, we have this uh, ratty, this is a very thickened, irritated annular pulley, um, A1 annular pulley right here. And so, and then short axis, we're focused on the level of the ganglion here. Both of these structures, the ganglion and the A1 pulley are working to stenose or, or, or um, uh, really restrict the, the, the tendon in that region. So there's a couple of videos. So we're watching the, this, we're, we're doing a flex in, flex extend. You're just watching how that, how that tendon really has a hard time being mobile underneath there. And in short axis as well, you're looking at the impingement of the ganglion cyst on the tendon itself, affecting its function. Okay. And extensor carpi ulnaris pathology. So we're looking at um, the extensor carpi ulnaris is the most common, the most, most tears, most tendon tears that happen in the hand and the wrist are usually the extensor carpi ulnaris. Now we're, we're leaving out decor veins um, because usually that, that doesn't involve frank tearing. I'm, I'm, I'm strictly referring to um, tears that occur and the tendon that tears the most in the wrist is the extensor carpi ulnaris. And so in this picture, we have, this is a, more of a tenosynovitis. So we have the ulna. So we're looking in short axis. We have the ulna right below it. And then we have the tendon itself here, which is a little bit thickened, but it's still pretty hyperechoic. It's still bright. It has this normal echo texture. But above it and around it, we see this dark halo, this fluid and thickened, thickened tendon sheath surrounding the tendon itself that is really irritated. And on the, on the picture on the right, this is a split tear. We see this, it almost, it, it takes up about three quarters of the diameter of the tendon. Couple that with the fluid and the thickening of the tendon sheath surrounding the extensor carpi ulnaris. This is a very irritated tendon. And this probably, this tendon tear probably runs longitudinally as well. So, and so these are very sensitive things that ultrasound is, is very good at picking up and, and very reliable, especially um, with, with a trained hand. Okay. And so we're going to go to the first dorsal compartment and the, the decor of Ains diagnosis. Okay. So ultrasound is highly accurate in depicting anatomic variations in the first extensor compartment. And it, a common thing to, a common theme with, with variations in, in anatomic normal are an osseous ridge as a sign of a septum dividing the first compartments into two separate sub compartments. So dual compartment of the anatomic variation has a high incidence rate of Quervain's disease for I'll, I'll theorize. I, I I'm sure there's, there's probably, it's probably not one It's probably not as, is probably not as cut and dry. just as one answer, but <laughs> the theory being in my eyes is uh, we're looking at it here is the, um, two sub compartments taking up more real estate, taking up more space in the tendon, in, in the tendon sheath itself makes it prone combined with this osseous ridge that has a tethering effect on the tendon. So this osseous ridge separates the tendon sub compartments. So we have the large compartment over the top and around and two separate sub compartments that operate superficially to each tendon independent. And so all of this works in, kind of works in synergy to put the patient at more risk or in a higher, in a higher incidence rate of acquiring the core veins. And we see it's kind of the same picture on the right with the um, Doppler on, on the uh, power Doppler on there looking for any active inflammation. But again, this is a, actually a little bit better picture of this osseous ridge that separates the two sub compartments. And so uh, this is more of a classic finding of decor veins here. So this is a, this is not an anatomic normal uh, anatomic variation. This is, this is one tendon sheath in one compartment where we have extensor, uh, extensor, their abductor pollicis longus and extensor pollicis brevis kind of looking like it's, it's in the same, in the same sheath here. So we can't, we're having a hard time differentiating the two, but surrounding it, we're seeing the sheath itself being really thickened and hypoechoic, and this is a sign of inflammation. So dark on ultrasound signifies fluid. 
fluids a sign of inflammation. And so couple that with the patient's signs and symptoms, um, ultrasound is a very accurate tool. And we're looking at vasculature um, adjacent to the, um, the, the first compartment. So whether the, main, the main vascular structures we need to worry about are the radial artery and obviously the radial nerve. So if you're doing a needle guided intervention here, you wanna put on the Doppler and know where the, the flow is. So you would try, you'd like to try to avoid it if you can. And so uh, uh, same picture on the right with no Doppler. And so this is an image of, this is gonna be a video of an oral collateral ligament tear um, where we're looking at, and I'll play it for you, but I'm gonna describe it first. So we have the adductor pollicis over the top um, where there's no tear in the adductor, in the adductor uh, aponeurosis of the adductor pollicis, but this right where the arrows are pointing, keep your eyes focused on, on this portion of the ligament. And as we do a valgus stress and gap and, and gap that, that joint itself, you're gonna see uh, the movement occur. So again, the dynamic utility of ultrasound, we're really, we're really able to uh, pick these things up with a high level of sensitivity. Okay, and looking at inflammatory arthropathy. So if you're, uh, if you're in rheumatology or, or if, you, if you're in a specialty where you see um, um, rheumatoid arthritis patients or gouts or any seronegative arthropathy, um, ultrasound is the tool of choice to evaluate these things, especially in the hand and the wrist. And so what we're looking at here is a couple different, I just want to, I, I, I put together some uh, like a greatest hits collection of, of what, what we find in what was classically found in rheumatoid patients in the hand and the wrist. So this is a tenosynovitis. This is, a, the, this is one of the extensor digitorums we're in long axis, but you see these thick and tendon sheath right above it. But what's all this mix, what's all this mixoid stuff there? It's not just a it's not just uh, one. It's not just one dark color. We have this mix of kind of bright and dark, all in the same tendon sheath. Well, this is what we call synovial hypertrophy. Okay, and so we have synovial hypertrophies as well as the the, the tenosynovitis, and looking at the level of these bones where all this bright stuff right underneath it. This is synovial hypertrophy as well. These are classically found in the rheumatoid. Um, rheumatoid population. And so we're looking at the same tendon in short axis here. We're looking at the, the fourth compartment. We have extensor indices and then the extensor digitorums. Um, looking at the, the thickening of the tendon sheath surrounding it. And as well as this, that mixed echo, that mixed echo texture, we have the dark mixed with the bright mixed with the dark. And then below it, we have these bright synovial hypertrophies that, that are, are right adjacent to um, the, the, the bony surfaces of the carpals. And so that, that's, that's your classic finding of, um, of rheumatoid and, 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 and tenosynovitis. And the picture on the left here, we're looking at some inflammatory arthropathies, bony erosions and synovial hypertrophies. Um, on the left is more the early stage and on the right is the later stage. And we'll point out, um, the, the, the picture on the left is a video and I'll play it. But what I wanna point out and what I wanna, what I wanna uh, the point I wanna make with it is make a comparison. So this is, or this, this I, the blood work turned out to be, this is the patient who came in. Um, they had just insidious onset swelling in the hand and the wrist and it got hot. Um, and they also were having some other, other areas in their body um, do the same thing, like in the feet. And their blood work came back with with uh, rheumatoid factor positive. So, what we're looking at here, these this is the radius. So this is back to my earlier protocol of the dorsal hand wrist. We have the radius, lunate, and the capitate. But we have all this swelling in here, and then we have some mixed kind of hyperechoic um, synovial tissue, and then the dorsal um, extensor tendon compartments over the top. So what we see here compared to the picture on the right is we're not seeing the same bony outlines, right? We have the radius, we have the, uh, the lunate and the capitate. It's really hard to tell where one stops and the other one starts because they've been eroded so much over a period of time. And we have synovial hypertrophies. 
So the fluid has been replaced by synovial hyper, hypertrophic changes and the extensor tendons and the tenosynovitis of that extensor tendon. And so this is a flexion extension of the wrist. So we're just watching, just, just watching the tendon kind of um, abut and, 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 and observing the quality of movement there um, in, that, in that patient. Okay, and then the scapulunae ligament. Um, I just threw up a comparison of a clenched fist on an x-ray. So that's how we stress the scapulunae ligament. Um, you can do it a couple different ways. You can do a clenched fist, a clenched fist or a radial ulnar deviation. Either way is pretty sensitive and pretty accurate at picking up um, the ligament tears, okay? But on the X-ray, I just want to, because this is a nice comparison, both are still shots. So this is uh, resting on the left, on the right is clenched fist, and we see this gap space. That's really abnormal, especially in the carpals where everything is really tight and pressure dependent. We shouldn't see gapping like this in the carpal, in the, in the carpal rows. And looking on the ultrasound, we have the scaphoid and the lunate. And then we're looking at this wide space here. There's no, that we should see a hyper. If you remember earlier in the slide, we saw the hyperechoic ligament of the scapha and lunate connecting the two bones. We don't see anything here. This is completely dissociated. So that's a, 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 just another highlight of ultrasound and using it in the hand and the wrist to diagnose um, tears, in the, especially in the scapha lunate. And so this is a dynamic picture of a scaphalunate ligament. Okay, so we have the scaphoid on the left, the lunate on the right. And this is a partial tear. When I, when I, when I play the video, I want you to pay attention to the scaphoid. I'm just, in this picture, I'm doing a uh, passive radial ulnar deviation to stress the proximal carpal row. And what you'll see is, you'll see the scaphoid kind of move down like a piano key that indicates that there's a partial tear. So you see the tear right here and the scaphoid moving away. That's atypical, okay? So we shouldn't see any bony movement with stress. You should see both the bone, ligament, bone relationship all move at the same rate. And in the first uh, carpal metacarpal osteoarthritis, um, after the knee and the hip, um, the, the this is a very common place to get osteoarthritis. And whether you're using it for diagnostics or needle, needle guided intervention, um, this is ultrasound is a great tool to evaluate it. And so this is a video, but I, what I wanna point out is um, on the right is the metacarpal. On the left is the trapezium. And what, what we're looking at is we have these kind of these two, we have like, it looks like a camel hump right here. So these bony outgrowths, these are consistent with bone spurs. And we see the capsule is really kind of tented and, and protruding from the joint space itself. And watching as the video plays, you see how close this space is together. And that's, that, that's a sign of, you know, to moderate to advanced um, osteoarthritis in the carpal metacarpal intersection. So um, I'm a part of some educational startups. Um, I, I have a training manual out on this website, as well as additional resources and, and uh, ultrasound courses on amsku.com. Um, we should be live in the next couple of weeks with it. And I, I really hope everybody who tuned in, I appreciate your time, um, first of all, wherever you are in the world, um, I hope you found something useful out of today's talk, and, and I'm humbled by um, Wysonic in allowing me to present. All right. Thank you, Colin. Um, so we're going to do a quick Q&A, about 15 minutes or so, and a few questions came in that I'll read off to you, Colin. Uh, okay. First one, um, in order to find the median nerve, people usually slide the probe from the forearm to the wrist so that, so that they find and see the median nerve. If you scan the wrist directly, is it easy to tell the median nerve from all the other surrounding tendons? Please explain why and how. So uh, 
I, I like to start the scan of the median nerve. So if I'm understanding the question, um, how are you differentiating the median nerve from the other structures? I think that's the gist of the question. Yeah. Okay. So yeah, the, the, the easiest way to know if you're on the median nerve or not is go uh, is start in the start in short axis in at the mid portion of the forearm. And the median nerve is a really bright hyperechoic structure that sits between the flexor digitorum profundus and superficialis. It's the only bright structure in that region. And from there, you can follow it distally into the carpal tunnel and keep your eye on it. Um, and then once you're in the carpal tunnel, um, I think I covered it in the, in the lecture. Once you're in the carpal tunnel, if you're unsure, if you're seeing the median nerve, or if you're looking at one of the flexor tendons, have the patient wiggle their fingers. That'll help identify whether it's a tendon or a nerve because the tendons contract, it'll bounce the nerve around, but the nerve itself won't contract. So that, that's, one, that's one tip to, to know whether you're looking at the nerve or the tendon. Right. I hope that's, I hope, I hope that answers the question. <laughs> All right. Um, then we had another question regarding the division of the wrist, which compartment three, four or five should we place the probe? Um, there's, there's no, there's no right answer to that. Um, you can, you can focus on, you could focus on one individually. Um, so like that's so going back to going back to those compartments, three, four and five, um, Remember, Lister's tubercle is what separates two and three. So when you're at Lister, just move it over one and you're on extensor pollicis longus. And you can just focus on the extensor pollicis longus and then go over to the extensor, the fourth compartment, the digitorum and the extensor indices, and then go over to the ulna and focus on the extensor digiti minimi. Or if you, or if you prefer to get them all in one shot, you can do that as well by, uh, by uh, aligning the probe over, uh, over those three compartments, um, three, four, and five. Um, I prefer to kind of individualize them um, just, just for sake of um, record keeping and storage. So it, it's, it's clear that, I'm, that I've looked at each one individually, but you can, certainly, you can certainly do it that way. Or if, like I said, if you prefer to get all three in the same shot, you can do that as well. It's the remember the wrist is a very, very small region, and and the most ultrasound probes are have the capacity and the diameter to get all three of those compartments in the same shot. All right. And then we had a question: um, How do you complete the incision and decompression of carpal tunnel syndrome with joint effusion under ultrasound guidance? And then how do you part two? How do you disinfect the transducer transducer in the treatment? Okay, well, I can answer. Um, I can answer the second part of that. Um, I, I'm not a surgeon. Um, I, I do. I do. I do some consulting for for some of those procedures. Um, if you're doing, th th there's ways to, and I'm certainly not going to answer this in the form of an expert as far as the decompression. Um, there's a lot of different ways to do them now. Um, uh, the, the, it used to be where the the only way to do it was open, and that was under general anesthesia. Now with the advancement of, of arthroscopy, um, we can do it under ultrasound guidance. Um, you know, as far as the approach, uh, I, I'm certainly I'm certainly not the person to speak on that technique. Um, but to to sterilize the probe, um, you you can use a cavi wipe as long as it's less than 50% um, alcohol. That that is a um, that is a sterile uh, technique to sterilize the probe. And then how do you treat a scapho, uh, scapholunate ligament tear in the in ultrasound? The same as the rupture of ankle ligaments, question mark? That's a great question. Um, yeah, very similar. You're, first of all, you want to you be able to know, um, you, you, you want to you know if, that, if, the, if there's any rotation in the scaphoid itself. If the scaphoid is rotating away, then that's going to be a surgical case. Okay. But if there's a, maybe like in that case I showed where there's a partial tear, um, you can certainly treat that as, as if you would an ATFL tear and keep your eye on it. Um, you're going to want to look at the x-rays and make sure there's no, 
underlying um, fracture of the scaphoid itself, because as we know, sometimes those can hide. Um, but as far as the treatment of a partial thickness scapulonate ligament, absolutely, you can treat it as you would um, a, a, an ATFL tear in the ankle or even like a, a medial collateral ligament tear in the knee. And then we'll do one more question. Uh, what is the difference between synovitis and joint effusion under sonography? Synovitis and joint effusion. So synovitis, and they're, they, um, good question. So joint effusion, joint effusion is not always synonymous with synovitis. Just because there's fluid in the joint or the joint capsule doesn't always mean that the um, synovium <laughs> itself is irritated. Um, typically when you're evaluating that, uh, sonographically, you're going to, you're going to, there's no standard, there's no standard, um, that I've read in the literature. This is just my expert opinion on, on when you're evaluating a synovitis. So you're going to look at the, the, the capsule or the surrounding, if it's the sheath or if there's a capsule in the joints, you're going to look for thickening of that capsule and what, you can do is look at the uninvolved side. So if you're unsure what you're seeing, is it, is it a thickened capsule with, with joint effusion or is it just joint effusion? Um, you can look at their other unaffected extremity and do a comparison really quick. And if, and, and, and that's a, and that's a quick way to um, decide, um, help you decide what you're looking at. I hope that helps. Uh, okay. So I think it's, uh, it's time to say goodbye. Uh, this is a very good, very good presentation. So thank you so much for Professor Rigney for sharing with these studies. And thank you so much for, uh, for the assistance uh, from uh, Dr. Talas Lee. And uh, thanks to all our audiences for staying with us all the time. So it's time for us to say uh, goodbye and end this uh, webinar for now. And I think uh, we will we'll be in touch in the future for more information about Visonic new webinars and all the replay webinars for all the past webinars. Uh, please follow Visonic official account on Facebook, LinkedIn, and YouTube. So let's see you next time. Thank you so much. Bye-bye. Thank you. Thank you.